Yeah. So, uh, so this is an informal or a formal? Informal. Uh, informal. Uh, informal. Uh, uh, okay, so today's lab is about precipitation hardening in aluminum alloy. Uh, so my name is Ankit and you can write to me at this email address if you have any questions later on regarding the lab. Okay, so today's objectives are, first of all we want to understand how certain alloys, uh, especially the aluminum alloys, they become stronger when you perform this process called the precipitation hardening heat treatment process. Uh, secondly, we want to acquire the basic skills to operate a hardness tester. So we will be having two different groups working on two different testers. Okay? Um, so you will be measuring the hardness of different samples which have undergone the precipitation hardening process. Uh, third is to understand the effect of aging heat treatment on mechanical properties. So basically the aging heat treatment is the same as uh, precipitation hardening. And you want to understand uh, how the materials will become stronger or weaker once you do this process. And the fourth one is to reinforce the understanding of the relationship between structure and mechanical properties to hands on experience. So you want to understand what's actually going on inside the material, which will make it either stronger or harder when you perform this precipitation hardening process. So uh, there are, it's not just the aluminum alloy, but there is a group of uh, other elements as well, which when from these compounds, they can also form uh, alloys which can be hardened using this process. So uh, the most common ones are these ones. So basically today, we will be focusing on the, on the top one, the aluminum 2024 alloy. And this alloy also is known as the aluminum 4% uh, copper alloy. <coughs> Uh, so, just to give a formal definition of what a precipitation or a age hardening is. So, by forming extremely small, uniformly dispersed particles of a second phase within the original phase, you make the material very, very strong. And this hardness actually is due to because you inhibit or you stop the motion of crystal defects. So basically, if you consider your main material as the original phase, and if I can form a very, very fine particles of a second phase, which are uniformly dispersed in the first phase, then this, these particles will actually help you to stop the movement of dislocations through your system. So if you can stop the dislocations, you can make your materials uh, even stronger. So basically, you have to form a uniformly dispersed second phase inside your first phase, and, that, and then you can increase the hardness. <coughs> so uh, we'll be using the aluminum 4% uh, copper alloy today. So just to give you an understanding of what's really going on in the process, so this is the equilibrium phase diagram of the uh, aluminum 4% copper alloy. Now you can see that this is just a section of the whole figure. The whole figure actually extends to the right, to the right end. This is the left end of the figure, or the aluminum rich end of the figure. Uh, you can see that Right now, aluminum 100%, 98, 96, 94, and so on. So you, you're increasing the weight percent of copper on the x-axis. Uh, so as I told you already, we are we have the aluminum 4% copper alloy. So we are somewhere along uh, this line of the phase diagram. So originally, we are going to be somewhere here at room temperature at the aluminum 4% copper alloy. Now. The whole process of precipitation hardening actually has three steps. So the first step is the solution treatment. Now what happens is that we want to minimize the segregation in the alloy and the dilution of elements that have got hardening. Now what does this mean? So basically when you're here, you have, whenever you are in this whole region, you have two phases, the alpha and theta. If you are only present in this phase, you have only alpha component. Here you have alpha plus L and completely L. So L is the liquid. The alloy completely melts and becomes a liquid if you, above, if you go above uh, this temperature. So basically, um, initially you are here in this region which you have alpha and theta both present. Now, what I do is I heat the alloy to really, so step one is here. So I, I start from here then I heat, 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 heat the alloy above, the, above this line, the solder line. And so I, I reach a temperature which is higher than uh, 500 degrees. So I'm going to be in this region. Now in this region you see from alpha plus theta 
I go to a region which only has alpha, right? So I kind of um, cause the dilution of elements, so everything kind of becomes one, mixed together very nicely. And this is essential to do before we want to form precipitates. So this step is the solution treatment. You heat the samples at around 500 degrees uh, for a few hours. The second step is called quenching. Now the quenching is to create a super saturated solid solution, also known as a metastable state. Uh, so what we do is we immediately take out the sample and we quench it. We, we drop it into water very, very quickly. So this time is really important. You can't wait for a while and then transfer it. You immediately transfer uh, the, the, the sample into water and you quench, so you cool down the sample really quickly. And what this does is it arrests the sample in its original state, so you don't uh, allow the, the theta phase to come up again. Because otherwise, if you just take out the sample, if I just leave it in the atmosphere, what I'll have is uh, the theta will start, so slow cooling will lead to phase separation. Again, you reach to the original state, alpha and theta, set it up. <coughs> I heat very, very uh, to high temperatures, and suddenly I cool down and quench the sample. Uh, so this is step two. Now the step three is the one which we will be performing today. Uh, it is called aging treatment or the precipitation hardening. Now we want to form really small coherent precipitates and cause the phase separation of supersaturated. So we want to cause phase separation, but we want to cause the phase separation in a very particular way. We don't want to just leave the sample and let it uh, phase separate by itself. So we start heating the sample again. Uh, so you can choose different temperatures, but for today's experiment, we'll be choosing 250 degrees. So we want to provide the energy to the sample for the theta phase to come out again, but now in the form of uniformly dispersed particles. So we heat the sample for a while, we keep aging, and we, refine, we, we start forming these really small, uh, tiny precipitates inside the original precipitate. And that's the main aim, to, to have the original matrix, the phase matrix, and have another phase inside the original phase. And this phase should be fine particles uh, uniformly dispersed in the original um, phase of the matrix. So basically three steps, heat really high, quench it down, and then perform the AG. And we'll be doing the, this transition from two to three today. <coughs> Uh, so what happens when you, so when I quench the sample and start the aging process, so it begins by uh, forming this, this atomic layer thin, so the black lines are actually the second phase uh, particles forming precipitate inside the first phase. So you see these, so this is a TEM image because these are really, really thin, um, uh, atomic layer thin second phase. So we have this TEM image in which you form, start forming these particles inside the original space. And these are called GP zones uh, because they are coherent with the main crystal. Now what do I mean by coherent is that so if you have your original matrix uh, and this is your precipitate inside the original matrix, we see that there is a coherency with the crystal. So you see that the atomic lines come in, go out. So there's no break in between. Of course, this is a second phase, but it only deforms the crystal a little, little bit. It doesn't uh, disconnect. So this is called a coherent precipitate. Uh, what happens if I keep the aging process, if I keep doing the aging process with time, these precipitates start becoming uh, bigger and bigger and so on. So you start increasing the size of these precipitates with time. and after a while, they will form, they will go a phase change and form a different phase. So if you imagine that a dislocation is going to come in, this is going to be more efficient in, in avoiding the dislocation to move through. But this particle will just let the dislocation go through. So this becomes uh, weaker. Now, for dislocation also, we have two different mechanisms by which a dislocation can move through. So either the dislocation will come in. So these are your your second phase particles. So a dislocation can come in and just loop around the particle and go through. Or the dislocation can come in and it can cut through your uh, precipitates. So one is called looping and the other one is called uh, cutting. The looping also is known as bowing. 
and some places. So if you see, uh, if, if the <coughs> x-axis is the radius of this um, second phase particle, when you have really, really small particles, initially you start forming these particles, um, it's easier to, to uh, it's easier to cut the particles because they're smaller, they're not so strong. So dislocation comes in and it can cut through. So if you see the red line, the, the cutting line, uh, so at smaller radius, cutting is the major mechanism by which a dislocation is going to move through. But if I'm if I'm my particles are quite big, I can't cut through so easily, but I can easily loop around these particles. So as you can see, these are two opposing sort of mechanisms for this location movement. And so there's a critical radius in which uh, you have the maximum uh, strength in the system. When this uh, present case can effectively avoid uh, sort of both, they're, they're resistant to both cutting and looping. So smaller radius, uh, easier to cut them, larger radius, easier to loop around them. <coughs> Just to give you an understanding that there is a, a size dependence on the strength of the uh, system. So the typical behavior uh, you expect is something like this. So this is a graph that you want, which I'm going to be plotting today. So on the y-axis, I have Wittgers hardness, which you will measure uh, from the hardness tester. So you take the sample, and you will measure the hardness values, uh, uh, three, three measurements, and you take an average of them. And then you plot the Wittgers hardness versus the aging time. So uh, we will divide you into two groups. And so one group will be doing the samples which were hardened by the previous group. So you'll basically be measuring uh, the hardness values for different times. And then the another group would actually be putting the samples in the oven, doing the hardening, and taking out the samples at fixed times, and doing the measurement again. So we, um, what you expect is that you expect something, a curve like this. So you want, uh, with aging time, the hardness will increase, and then it should go on decrease. Okay? Uh, if you see here, if you perform the aging at a higher temperature, then you reach the maximum value much faster. <coughs> see, from here, for example, uh, you reach the maximum below one hour. Here, you need more than 10 hours. So higher the temperature, it's easier to perform the precipitates, and, and the process is faster, and you get maximum value uh, much quicker. <coughs> so today, uh, so these two steps have already been done before, the solutionizing or the homogenization and the quenching has already been done. So today, as I told you, you have two groups. So one group would actually be uh, putting the samples in, in an oven for two three, at 50 degrees and then taking out at uh, so 10, 20, 30, 45, and 60. So you have five different times. 10, 20, 30, 45, and 60 minutes. And each of these times, you have to measure the Hardness, um, hardness value. So on your on your papers, it's actually uh, six measurements, but we'll actually be doing five. So you should correct the measurement table at the end. So you should have a measurement table. So the first sample is uh, uh, R, which is as we see. Second one is Q, which is quenched. Then you have 10, 20, 30, 45, and 60. <coughs> yeah, so this is uh, R, this is Q, 10, 20, 30, 45, and 60. Yeah. Yeah, he 